Bruchem Aboim. Again, welcome everybody. Welcome to our home. And um, again, the name of the lecture this week on my thoughts will be The Origin of the Name Jew. Now, Wikipedia states that according to the book of Genesis, the name Judah, Yehuda, was the name of the fourth son of our patriarch Jacob. During the Exodus, this name was given to the tribe of Judah, those who descended from their patriarch Yehuda. After the conquest and settlement of the land of Canaan, the name Judah also referred to the territory that was allocated to that tribe. Now, after the splitting of the United Kingdom of Israel, the name, the name Judah was used to refer to the southern kingdom of Judah. That kingdom was under the reign of a descendant of King David, David Amalek. It was comprised of the tribes of Judah, Binyamin, and Shimon, along with some of the cities of the Levites. With the destruction of the northern kingdom of Israel, Samaria, the kingdom of Judah became the sole Jewish state, and the term Yehudi was now applied to all Israelites. Now, the term Yehudi occurs 74 times in Tanakh. 74 is the gematria, the numerical value of the Hebrew words, Hu Ha'ach HaGadol, he is the great brother. Now, as we know that the kings of Israel were descended from the tribe of Yehuda, and as we read in the portion of Ayaki and the blessings that was given to him by his father Yaakov on his deathbed, he said, Lo Yosser Shevet Mi Yehuda, that the scepter, meaning kingship, will not depart from Yehuda. Now, the first person to be given the name Yehuda was, again, as I mentioned before, the fourth son born to Yaakov Avinu. He was named by his mother Leah, though. She had named her first three sons with names that were all connected in some way with her complicated relationship with her husband Yaakov. It seems that the mothers of Israel all prophetesses and that they knew that Yaakov was destined to sire 12 sons. It was thought that since he had married four women, that each of them would give birth to three of his sons. So when Leah gave birth to her fourth son, well, she felt emboldened. She no longer named her sons with names that related to the loveless relationship that existed between herself and Yaakov. She thought that he would feel more affection for her now that she had given him more sons than any of his other wives. <laughs> I love that. You know, there is the name Yehuda was her way of expressing her gratitude to God Almighty for being given more than her share. As Rashi states in the portion of Ayetze, says there she's where she says, For I have received more than my share. From now on I must praise. So she named her son Yehuda, which is made up of five Hebrew letters. Four of those letters spell out God's special name of mercy the yud ke vav ke, with the addition of the letter the Hebrew letter Dalid, which has a numerical value of gematria of four, alluding to the fact that he, Yehuda, was the fourth son born to Yaakov. Now, the Ger Rebbe states that the name Yehuda was, has within it God's name of mercy with the addition of the letter Dalid, which alludes to the Hebrew word Dal, which means lowly. This is an allusion to the fact that even if Yehuda will fall, God Almighty will always be there to assist him in rising, raising him up again. Now, since we carry his name Yehuda, Jew, we can be certain that God will always be our source of salvation. He will always be with us also. Now, the Torah Shlema states that Yehuda was the fourth son born to Yaakov and Leah, and this coincides with the fourth day of creation, the day that God created the luminaries which brings light into the world. This is an allusion to the fact that a descendant of Yehuda, Mashiach Tzikeno, the Messiah, will also bring light into this world. Again, may he come quickly and in our time. Rabbeinu Bachai states that in the blessing that was given to Yehuda, we find every letter of the Hebrew alphabet found except the letter Zion. The letter Zion also alludes to Kilei, Kilei, Kilei Zion, weapons of war. Uh, this is an allusion to the fact that Mashiach, the Messiah, will not achieve victory through military force. He will succeed by virtue of divine intervention. Now, the missing Zion is also an allusion to the fact that Yehuda 
was the seventh of the patriarchs. If you start from Avram Avinu, Yaakov, pardon me, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Uvein, Shimon, Levi, and Yehuda, the seventh. In addition, the number seven always has a connection to the Shabbat, the holiest day of the week, the day that supplies blessings to all the other days of the week. The name Yehuda is connected to the Hebrew word Hodah, which means thanks or gratitude. When we thank anyone for any, any and all of the kindnesses that they have performed for us, we refer to this gesture as gratitude, this, je pardon me, this gesture of gratitude as hakoros hatov, a recognition of the goodness that someone has done for us. This presents a this present, pardon me, this represents a statement that expresses a much deeper sense of appreciation than just telling someone thank you. Gratitude is what Judaism and serving God Almighty is predicated on. You know, we have an obligation to thank not only God Almighty, we also have a moral obligation to thank anyone or anything that has done us a kindness. The question we have to ask is, how long does that, does that expression of gratitude extend? Is there a statute of limitations? If we look into the Torah in the book of Exodus, we read about the story of Moses and the ten plagues that were brought on the Egyptians in Egypt. The commentaries tell us that Moses did not participate in the execution of the first three plagues, turning the waters of the Nile into blood, bringing frogs out of the waters of the Nile, and then turning the soil of Egypt into lice. Well, what was the reason that he excused himself from bringing these three plagues? Our sages tell us that Moses had benefited from both the waters of the Nile and the soil of the land of Egypt. The water had floated his cradle when Miriam, his sister, placed him in the Nile. The soil had allowed him to bury the body of the Egyptian taskmaster that he had killed when he had witnessed him viciously beating a Jewish slave. So from Moses, we learn that gratitude is not limited to people. It can even extend to inanimate objects. Imagine, if we are expected to express our gratitude to things that have no feelings, how much more so should we thank people for any and every kindness that they perform for our benefit? If we look closer at this scenario, we come to realize two more important factors. First, these events took place some 80 years previously. After all, Moshe was only three months old when his cradle was placed in the Nile. And some commentaries state that he was 13 years old when he killed the Egyptian taskmaster. So the question that we have to ask is, if someone had done you a favor, just how long are you indebted to that person? From Moses we learn, forever. In addition, if we examine the fact, we would notice that neither the water nor the land did really anything special for Moses. The water just did what it was created to do. Water will float anything that is lighter than it is, and so to the land. It will allow anyone to bury anything within it. So what did we learn from this story? That not only are we expected to show gratitude to someone who goes out of the way to show us a kindness, but even if, that kind, even if the kindness that they do is something that they are actually being paid to perform, it is their job, such as a, a mailman or a waitress, a bagger in a supermarket, yes, even a doorman. The fact that they are being paid for the service that they render does not negate the fact that you owe them an expression of gratitude. Thank you. I thought it would be interesting to take a closer look at the life of Yehuda since he is one of the central characters in the narrative of the story. As we read, Yehuda played a major role in the sale of Yosef and then again in defense of his younger brother, Binyamin. He was designated by his father on his deathbed to be the ruler of the Jewish nation and the ancestor of the Messiah. Rashi in chapter 28 states that the brothers removed Yehuda from his position of authority after they were forced to witness the grief and suffering that they had caused their elderly father. They said to him, you said to sell him. Well, had you have said to return him home, we would have listened. From Rashi, we see that the brothers placed the blame of the sale of Yosef squarely on the shoulders of Yehuda. Yehuda saved Yosef from being killed by his brothers. His reasoning was that nothing would be gained if they killed him. 
and so he proposed that instead of killing him, they should sell him as a slave. The Marsha, based on the Talmud in Sanhedrin, states that whoever praises Yehuda for having stated they should kill him, since there would be no monetary gain, blasphemes God. He should have evoked the fear of God as a deterrent against committing murder, not the consideration of profit. He had caused his father to mourn for Yosef for 22 years, and for that grievous sin, Yehuda paid a heavy price. After all, he was the only one of the brothers to bury a wife and two children in, his, in their lifetimes. Yaakov, his father, had also buried his beloved wife, Rachel, mourned the loss of his favorite son, Yosef, and Shimon had now been taken a prisoner in Egypt. The only way to truly understand another person's pain is for you to experience the same pain that they've had to endure. God was giving Yehuda a wake-up call. Now, Yehuda chose Shua as his wife. The name Shua has in Gematria a numerical value of 376, which is the same numerical value as the Hebrew word shalom, peace. He was hoping that by beginning all over, starting with the first mitzvah that was given to mankind at the dawn of creation, to be fruitful and mul multiply, he could somehow right his ship. The Torah states, Bayar Shom Yehuda, and Yehuda saw there. He chose his wife with his eyes externally. She was beautiful. He didn't bother to look deeper at her internal beauty. This is similar to Shimshon, Samson, who married a Philistine woman since she was pleasant in his eyes. Again, an external physical beauty, not one connected to an internal spiritual beauty. He paid heavily for choosing the physical over the spiritual. The Philistines took out both of his eyes. When the brothers came down to Egypt to buy food, they also came with the intent of looking for their brother Yosef. Where did they look? In the red light district of Egypt. Because he was so handsome, they, they naturally assumed that he had been sold as a male prostitute. This was the way that you could have saved Yosef from death. You know, I wonder, given a choice between death and being forced into a life of male prostitution, which one would you choose? Again, Yehuda paid heavily for his actions. The wife that he had married for her physical beauty died. Two out of three of his sons died under the age of 13 years of age. At a, you know, at a bar mitzvah, the young man is called up to the Torah, and after his aliyah, his father is called to, to recite a prayer stated, says, Hacher Patreni, he who has released me from being punishable for this boy. Which means that up until the age of 13 for a boy and 12 for a girl, a parent accepts the responsibility for the actions of their children, meaning that a parent can receive punishment for the transgressions committed by their children. There is a measure that states that when the Jewish nation stood at the foot of Mount Sinai at the giving of the Torah, God requested a guarantor that the children of Israel would fulfill all of his commandments. Well, they offered their word, and then their lives, but God didn't accept either. Then they said, we offer our children's lives as guarantors of us keeping the Torah. The, of keeping the Torah. Well, guess what? Got that. God accepted. Based on this medrash, a young child can be punished because of the sins of their parents. So the sins of Yehuda's two young sons may not have warranted their untimely deaths. However, when judged in conjunction with the sin committed by their father Yehuda, this may well have contributed in the death of his two young sons. He had sold his brother into a life of sexual depravity. One of the consequences of his actions was that both of his sons were killed by God for a sin of seminal omission. In addition, he, he is duped into having relations with his daughter-in-law, who poses as a prostitute on the road. After the brothers had sold Yosef, they attempted to cover up their treachery. They slaughtered a goat and dipped his coat of many colors into its blood. They sent the garment to their father and asked him to identify if it was Yosef's. And now from Tamar's message sent to Yehuda, he hears the same exact words that were said to his father when he was shown Yosef's coat, torn and covered with blood. Haker no. Do you recognize this? These were the exact same words that Tamar sent to Yehuda when she identified herself as the prostitute. 
that he had had sexual relations with on the road. And with these words, she identified him as the father of her twins. All that goes around, comes around. Now, Yehuda admits that she was innocent, and it was he who was the guilty party. And with that admission, and the acceptance of the embarrassment it, that it brought him, Yehuda now began his road back to being the leader of the family, and the tzaddik who would be the progenitor of the Messiah. Rabbi Yonasim Uziel states that because he was able to admit his mistake publicly, he did not try to rationalize that it would have been better to not tell the truth just this one time. It may well be the reason that he was chosen. After all, no one other than he and Tamar knew the truth. The portion of Vayigash opens with the Hebrew words, Vayigash, I love Yehuda. And Yehuda approached the Viceroy Yosef. Now the last letter of these three words spell out the Hebrew word Shaveh, which means equal. Both of their descendants would be kings and leaders. Yehuda through the kingship of Dovna Melech, King David, and continuing all the way to the Mashiach ben David, the Messiah. And Yosef starting with Yehoshua, who would lead the Jewish nation into the land of Canaan after the death of Moshe, his teacher, which was in addition to Yerobim ben Nevat, who was the great prophet who was to seed with the ten tribes of Israel and begin the northern kingdom the kingdom of Israel that reigned for some 300 years. Also, the signs that their tribes bore were also indicative of their royal stature. The sign of the tribe Yehuda is a lion, the king of beasts. And the sign of Yosef is an ox, the king of domesticated animals. According to Kabbalah, images of both the lion and the ox are also found on the Kisei HaKavod, God's throne of glory. This is in addition to the eagle, the king of birds, in the face of Yaakov, the most elite of the forefathers, which represents man, the king of the world. So with the story of both Yosef and Yehuda, we witness the growth and development of two great tzaddikim. This teaches us that though they were both born with special souls, still for them to reach their potential, they both needed to experience life with all of its challenges. We read about how Yosef went from a boy who was concerned about his appearance and his glory to becoming a world leader, whose concerns were about others more than himself. He even reached the point of being able not only to forgive, but even support the brothers who had treated him so treacherously. Not only did he support his whole family, Yosef supported the whole world. He truly earned his title of Yosef HaTzadik, Joseph the Righteous One. So with Yehuda, so too with Yehuda. He went from a young man who was focused on jealousy, violence, and physical beauty to a brother who was willing to give up his freedom, even his life in the hereafter, to save his younger siblings from a lifetime of servitude. This was all done in the hope that he would now be able to protect his elderly father from any further pain and suffering in life. So from Yosef, we learn that forgiveness is a gift that you give yourself. And from Yehuda, we can learn the concept of growth on a personal level and gratitude to both man and God Almighty on a communal level. And with that, let us hope to bring the descendant of Yehuda, Mashiach Sakana, quickly and in our time. I'd like to thank you all for participating, for listening to this lecture. Again, God should bless you with health and happiness and safety. And again, Shabbat Shalom. Again, Hanukkah is over, but keep the lights burning. God bless you and be well.